come up and he's going to bring the most wonderful word we've ever heard. All right, let's watch. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, his disciples... Well, good morning, church. Everyone doing all right? You guys cut off my video before it was, before it was supposed to end. <laughs> Come on. No, it's, it's cool. We're going to get back there. We're going to get back there. So uh, this scripture that we have been looking at now this morning, John chapter 4, is a part of the vision series that we started quite a while ago. Um, this is the third week of the series, and we have literally just been asking the question, what does this passage have to say to us about hope and salvation? We as a church have a vision, and that is to bring hope and salvation to our community. That's our vision. And we believe that this scripture really brings that out from Jesus' perspective and even from the Samaritan woman that we're going to see a little bit later. Now, um, as I look out across the room, I see that many faces that I know, and I also see many faces that I do not know, so I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jason, 
And last year, and for many years before that, I was a pastor here at Eastside Community Church. And last year, I decided to, well, I received a call to move into a missions organization. So I decided to go and join that missions organization. And all we do is we serve the global church, global missionaries, global organizations. Um, and so um, I'm a part of a team that, that does that. And as I've been interacting with people uh, from this church and many ministers and missionaries outside of this church, a question that they often ask me when they hear that I'm still staying at Eastside is, why? <laughs> like, you still at your church? Why are you still at your church? Many pastors are very confused about this, like, especially as I interact with them. And I have, I have a very good reason why I'm still a part of Eastside Community Church. The same reason why I came to Eastside before I was a pastor, same reason why I stayed at Eastside well, and I became a pastor, and the same reason why I stayed at Eastside as a member of this church. The first is this, I love this community. As I look out across this room, I see people that I love, and I know that love me and my family. And that's what church is meant to be about. It's meant to be about community. Now, don't get me wrong. You, you all, you're all, you're all imper imperfect, right? You're not perfect. This is not a perfect community. Whenever, I, uh, whenever people come up to me, like came up to me as a pastor and they said, I love Eastside, it's such a welcoming place. I'm like, just wait. <laughs> no, it's amazing. I'm like, just wait, <laughs> right? Because we're an imperfect people. But we have, like, once you get over that, <laughs> the imperfection, we begin to live with each other and love each other. And, and that's, what, that's, what, that's one of the reasons why I say it. The other reason why I say it is because I love the vision of our church. I love it. If you go out across Pretoria East, Pretoria East has some amazing churches. If you're church hopping and you want to find a good church, come speak to me. I'll point you to them, right? There's some good churches here. But every church expresses the mission of God in a very different way within a city. Tim Keller speaks about it being a gospel ecosystem, right? Not one, if, you, if every church was the same, we would have a problem. Eastside, our vision is to bring hope and salvation. It drives every decision. The reason why we decided to build this school across, just like across this, like this wall, is because we believe that God is calling us to bring hope and salvation to our community. And that was one way that we can do that. And today, we have hundreds of kids. I think it's about 100 and something kids that come to our school. I don't know the exact number. Huh? 180, our word, 180 kids and their families are being ministered to because we believe that God is calling us to bring hope and salvation. I had Debbie Warren at my house. She, she was the, one of the founders of Abbas Pride, which is the mission branch of our, of our church. And she was at our, at our home and she said, they're feeding over 900 kids a day through Abbas Pride's ministry. A day. That was a vision that was birthed out of bringing hope and salvation, partnering with local churches across the city and resourcing them. That's why we started that. That's why we do Sunday services. That's why we're here right now is to bring hope and salvation. Life groups is about hope and salvation. The care ministry that Samora spoke about is about bringing hope and salvation. Everything that we do needs to filter into that. And I bought into that. And that's why when we bring our tithe together, we bring our money together, I bring my salary, I bring a tenth of that, I pour it into a pot, you bring your tenth, your tenth, and we bring it in, and I know that when I do that, we can do ex like exponentially more, because we all have a vision for the same thing, <laughs> to bring hope and salvation. That's why we as a church do crazy things sometimes. Two, so three years ago, we decided we're going to plant another campus in Hatfield, for the students. Why? Because we saw students who at that stage had no expression of church. And we said, we want to bring hope and salvation to this place. We had one student at Tux campus, one. <laughs> it made no sense. But we felt the call of God to bring hope and salvation. And today, there are, you guys mentioned a couple, there was like a hundred and something kids, students, sorry, I always call them kids. <laughs> and now I know I'm getting old, I'm calling students kids. <laughs> like, students, Hearing the gospel every single week on Wednesdays and Sundays, it's a beautiful experience. Why did we do that? To bring hope and salvation. And so that's why I stayed. That's why I remain here at the church, because I, believe, I love you guys. I love this community, and I love our vision. And it's this, this series is all about that vision. It's about bringing that vision to the forefront of our minds, because let's just be honest, it doesn't matter how long you've been here, John, right? It doesn't matter how long you've been a member at a church, we always need to be reminded of the vision that God has given us, why we are here, why are we doing what we are doing. 
And over the past two weeks, the sermons have been great, first with Jesse and then with Michael last week. And as they've been speaking, I've been wrestling with a question for myself. And it's like, I th- maybe it's because I've transitioned out of being a pastor, and now I'm a normal member like you, right? And the question has been this, and you can put that up on the screen. How am I bringing hope and salvation to my world, right? Now, the reason why it's in that first person, and the reason why it's been challenging me so much, is because I find, it, I find it's very easy for me to hide in the we of the vision, right? I find it very easy for, to say, we bring hope and salvation through all of these amazing ministries. That's what we do as a church. It's actually very compelling if you think about, like, the, the global church gets really wrong. There's some terrible stories out there. But for every terrible story about what the church has done, there's a thousand amazing things that the church, hundreds of thousands of amazing things the church is doing every single day. Our expression, feeding 900 kids, that's just us as a community. When you extrapolate that onto a global scale, I think one of the best like, reasons to be a Christian is because of the impact Christianity is making in the world. We don't get that spotlighted in the news. They don't like spotlighting that. So it's easy, it's easy for me to say, this is why I'm a Christian. This is why I'm a part of this church, because we do that. It's easy for, for me to hide in the we. And I would just step back and say, how am I, as Jason, how am I bringing hope and salvation to my community, to my, in my spheres of influence? How am I bringing hope and salvation to that lady who's selling me flowers when I buy my wife flowers? How am I bringing hope and salvation to that person who's giving me ice creams that I'm giving to my kids? How am I bringing hope and salvation to those friends of mine who I may or may not be interacting with who don't know Jesus? Are you guys following what I'm saying? How am I bringing hope and salvation to my world? And I'd like you to take a moment just to think about that for a moment. How, and ask yourself that question. If you, if you believe in this vision of bringing hope and salvation, which I hope you do because it's a biblical vision, it's what God is calling us to do in our lives. He's got a meaning. He's got, it's a meaning making here. How am I bringing hope and salvation to my world? Now, what I don't want as we look at this question is that I really don't want to cause you to feel shame or anxiety. Because I'll be honest, if it's just me, maybe you're looking at this question, you go, Jason, I got a I got hundred things to put on this list. Right here, I got a hundred things. Good for you. Come preach next week, right? Okay. But as I looked at this and I've been wrestling with this, I've been experiencing a level of anxiety. Like, how am I doing this? But what I don't want is I don't want you to, to live in that. I don't want you to live in shame because shame is never a good motivator. Right? How many of you guys have um, been like at Christmas time? We all know we eat a lot of food during Christmas, right? At the end of cr- the Christmas season, how many of you felt, looked at yourself and been like, man, I feel so fat? I shouldn't have eaten all that food, right? And then out of that shame, you, you like, you're like, I need to feel good, and you go grab a chocolate, and then you chomp your chocolate down. Anyone? Okay, cool. Like, we're, okay, we're being honest, right? And that's, that's, like, that's not what I want, because shame never motivates us. But I, what, what I want this to do is I want us to be honest about this. I want to move us from being a, in a place of reflection to a place of action, And so I reframe this question for myself, and I'm reframing it for you. Can you put the next question up? And it's simply this. How can I, how can I bring hope and salvation to my world? It's a very different question. It's not how am I. You might be able to answer that question. But I want to answer the question today, how can you? Because I believe if you're here today, you are wanting a little bit more of Jesus in your life. That's why you come to church. You're You're wanting to live with a certain level of purpose with your life. And so today and this entire series is actually not about reflection, although we're going to be doing that. It's actually about action, to say, how can we as individuals bring hope and salvation to our community, to our own particular world? And so that's why we've been digging into John chapter 4. And we are going to continue doing that today. So I want you, John chapter 4. Now look at that picture. You've got a little bit of like a hamburger there. And the reason why we've got a hamburger there is because Jesus speaks about food in this passage, right? Over the past couple of weeks, we've been stopping at about verse 26 of John chapter 4. But when you zoom out, there's actually a macro story that's being told here. And that's that, that intro that we've just done of the woman at the well is actually just the intro part. Now, when I was at school, 
in primary school, I remember this very particularly, my English teacher drew a big hamburger on, this, on like the whiteboard, and she was speaking about storytelling and writing stories, and she said, every good story is like a hamburger. It's got the buns, which is the intro and the conclusion, and the good stuff is in the middle. I suppose she was just trying to help us write better stories from grade four. I mean, how can you write a good story? And we've been focusing in on that bun part, and there are some like, cool elements you can pick off the seeds, and you can like taste, you know, buns... Different buns taste differently, right? And so we've been unpacking that a bit, but we're going to dig into, we're going to go a little bit further today, and we're going to go into the middle part, which is the meat part, which is where the whole idea of the food, the food comes in. Because Jesus says, um, he has this encounter with the woman at the well. The disciples come, the woman runs off, and she goes and she says to, to her community, come and see. And then the disciples are confused. They're like, what is going on? Why is he interacting with this woman? And if you want to understand the backstory, you can listen to last week's message and the week before. And he, he, he says to them, guys, like, they're like, do you want food, Jesus? He's like, I, the food that I receive is to do the will of the Father. And then he starts speaking about the harvest field. And he, he's explaining to them why he was interacting with the woman, why he was connecting and investing in this woman. He explains to them that God has got a purpose for him and therefore us as Christians because we are in Christ. And that is to go out into the harvest field and to bring hope and salvation. He was saying, guys, my, my purpose is to do the will of the Father and that feeds me. And that will is for me to bring hope and salvation to all communities, not just the Jews, but the Samaritans and to the ends of the earth. That's the meat. And then you got the other end, which brings them to a nice conclusion. The woman brings, she invites her entire community to come in and experience Jesus for themselves. Concludes the story. And so today, I want to ask you to pick up that piece of paper that you have in your seat. Tomorrow, can you bring it, pass it to me so I can just show everyone? Okay, this little piece of paper, right? Jesse spoke about the connecting and investing. That's, that's verses 1 through to 27, 28, 29, where Jesus is interacting. He connects with a woman. He interacts with her. He invests in her. And he invites her into something different. You have this woman run out and invite her community in. And that's what we're going to be following. So we're going to complete the rest of that story. So can I ask you to play the rest of the Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for, Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. So, 
what I hope that's like, as I drew that picture of the hamburger, right? What I hope that you're getting from this is that there is a narrative that John is trying to teach us, right? The story of the Samaritan woman is part of a much bigger story. The story of the Samaritan town is part of a much bigger story. There's a narrative that's being told here, and it's this, that the heart of the Father is for us to go out into the harvest field. For Jesus said, I've come to go out into the harvest field to reap. And he's calling his disciples to do the same. And there's other scriptures where he sends, he says, I'm sending you out into the harvest field. It's, ra- it's ripe and ready, right? And so that story of him, why is he reaching out to the woman? Why is he connecting? Why is he investing? Why is he inviting that woman into a, like a better life? It's for one reason, it's because of the Father's will for us. And the Father's will for him was to bring hope and salvation to all people, to all communities. Now you, each and every single one of you, live in very different spheres of of society. We've all come together today, but as you go out here, you're gonna go out all across the city, and for those of you online, wherever you are, you're gonna go out into your own communities, into your own families, you're gonna be interacting with people I will never interact with in my entire life, even though we're in the exact same city. Why? Because God has knitted us into community. We all have different jobs, we all have different families, we all have different friends, we all go to different shops, right? And the whole point of this I simply ask, how can I bring hope and salvation to those spaces? And so in week one, Jesse spoke about this idea of connecting. And if you turn that page around, you'll see that there's eight little, I think there's eight, seven, eight. I don't know. A lot of pressure when you're counting and a lot of people watching you. Okay, so there's eight little arrows And Jesse basically said, okay, guys, we're all connecting with people. Week one, Jesus sat at the well, and he could have done what many of us do when we're sitting at our own wells, when we're going to our own shops, to just ignore everyone. Jesus had every right to ignore that Samaritan woman, every single right, literally. It was expected. And that whole interaction is like a confusing interaction for the Samaritan woman because he's doing something unexpected. He intentionally connected. Who are the people that you can intentionally connect with on a weekly, daily, monthly basis, right? All different. It could be the people at the shops. It could be the friends that you have. It could be your family members. It could be your work colleagues. It could be anyone and anything that you can get your mind around. If you're connecting with people, there are people around you, that is an option. And the challenge is simply to to do this, to write their names. And you might not even know their names yet, right? Like I said to you, one of my my names, her name is Magda. Maybe you guys know, maybe maybe someone will know Magda, but she... She, she sells flowers at a flower shop. Macht is on my list, right? Like she, knows, she now knows my name because I ordered flowers. For, you know, so she's like, oh, Jason, welcome. Okay, so we now know each other. She's on my list. I'm praying for her. I've got other friends who don't know Christ. They're on this list. Who are your people that you're going to be intentionally praying for and intentionally connecting more intentionally with? It might mean that you go to the same teller when you're at the Willies. You let people pass you. So you can be at the same teller every single week. It doesn't matter what it is. Who can you intentionally connect with? The next step, and this is where Michael spoke last week. He spoke about this idea of investing. Jesus didn't just intentionally connect with this woman. He went deep with her. And like, he, look, he's God, so he can go deep quick, right? He's, I mean, he brought out, he's like, you're having like, you have multiple husbands. <laughs> that's like a, that, that's a, I mean, you don't just have that conversation off the bat, right? Like for you and I, that's going to be a couple of weeks and months into a relationship where you're investing that deeply. You're like, hey, listen, can I call, talk about this area of your life? right? But he, Jesus was intentional about going deep with those people. I'm going deep with Magda. She just doesn't know it yet, right? <laughs> I'm going to be inviting Magda to come to church. You know, like the, so there, there's all of these things. You, let's be praying intentionally. Now, the thing that I want to be focusing in on today, and I want to encourage you, if you weren't here the past two weeks, go and listen to those messages. Because I really, when we're thinking about evangelism, and we're talking about reaching people for Christ, I think I often think about the, seventh, the um, Jehovah Witnesses that walk on my street every Saturday. They are super awkward. The one day I stood in the middle of the street and I waited for them to come to me. <laughs> and this guy started asking me about, like, do I believe in the end times? And I said a whole bunch of stuff that I won't say from stage, right? But the point is, it's like we think that's what it is, but it begins with something like this. It begins with a connection. Before you and I, it begins with investing. It begins in relationship. And then we can move into the next level, which is what we're going, where we're moving to, which is inviting, sharing, and discipling. 
Today, I have the privilege of speaking about inviting, and there's two invites that we see in John chapter 4, and both of them are important for us. Both, are, both share like very practical principles that we can learn. The first is this. It's from Jesus to the woman. But he's interacting with this woman of the well, and he says, if you only knew the gift that God had for you, if only you knew. And that same question goes out to each and every one of us. There are some of you that are here today, and you do not know what God has for you. Some of you do, and you're smiling, and you know, this is, I've experienced that gift. And he speaks about it. So it's, a, it's a water, a spring of water that bubbles up to eternal life. And it's an invitation that goes out to you today to say, have you accepted that invite? That woman accepted that invite despite her background, which was notorious. She accepted that invite from Jesus. And instantly, what did she do? She dropped her well, or she dropped her vase or whatever at the well, and she ran back. And this is where the second invite comes from. Number two, the Samaritan woman then invites her community, to come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Now, this is what's really important for me. I'm going to be drawing out a couple of things from, this, from just this passage here because we can learn from the example of the woman at the well. Many of us don't want to invite people, right, to come to church. We don't want to share our faith. We don't want to try and disciple people. Why? Because we stop and we think to ourselves, Yo, I don't, oh, they know me. <laughs> they've seen me swear on my community WhatsApp group. Right? They, they've seen me drive. <laughs> they, they know how, what I did in that one business. Whatever. Like, we have, people know us. Right? The reality was that this community knew this woman. The only reason why that woman was at the well at noon and she was the only one was probably because all the other women in the town wanted nothing to do with her because she was sleeping around with a whole bunch of other people, right? She was an outcast of the community. But she still, despite that, experienced that invite and said, you've got to come and you've got to see this man. It was a simple invite. She didn't say, I figured it all out. I, let me open up my Bible and quote the scriptures to you right? She didn't have every answer to every question. She had this much interaction with Jesus. All she said was, come and see. Come and see. And if you are wanting to begin to be mobilized into bringing hope and salvation, the very lowest entry level to that, before you begin to share your faith, is simply to be able to stay, step out of your little comfort zone and say, come and see. Come and see. I have nothing else to say. Just come and see. And what's beautiful about this scripture these words come and see. And Michael did this last week where he said, you know, there's this beautiful connection between Nicodemus in the previous chapter and Jesus in his interaction with this woman as well. And there's a beautiful connection. John has written, like when, when these people wrote the scriptures, they wrote it intentionally. And in this moment, we have this Samaritan woman going and using the words, come and see this man. And a whole, the, uh, the gospel broke out into whole new ethnic group, whole new community. The very first time the words of come and see were used was in John chapter 1. And it's actually, there's only four times in the book of John where come and see is used, right? The first is when the very first disciples started following after Jesus. John the, John the baptizer looked at Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God who's come to save the world. And two of his disciples got up and started following Jesus, and he turned to them and they say, he said, what do you want? And they said, hey, we want to just like see what's happening here. And he said, come and see. The first two disciples became disciples of Jesus, not through anything Jesus said except for come and see. Then we see a ripple effect of these guys going out and telling their friends. And one of those disciples goes out and says to his friend, come and see a man. Could he be the prophet? Could he be the Messiah that we've been waiting for? John chapter 4, verse 20, exact, it's a parallel. It's a connection. This very same reason, the way that the gospel broke out among the Jews was the very same reason why the gospel broke out among the Samaritans and will be the very same reason why the gospel breaks out in Pretoria East. But God's people saying, simply saying, come and see. Come and see. Come and see, Jesus. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. 
I want to read a story to you. And before I get there, just a key thought. Could it be that one invitation is all it could take to change one of those people's lives that's on your list? And I really hope that by now you've, you've actually started to fill out this list. I really hope. I'm not at eight yet, I'll be honest, because I'm, I'm really being intentional about it. I'm at about five, <laughs> right? But I hope that you're beginning to think and pray about this list because that's how we, that's how we move beyond the weeds to the eye, right? So I want to read a story to you. It's about Albert McMacken. Albert McMacken was a 24-year-old farmer who had recently come to faith in Christ. He was so full of enthusiasm that he filled his truck with people and took them to a meeting to hear about Jesus. There was a good-looking farmer's son who was especially keen, that he was especially keen to get to the meeting. But this young man was hard to persuade. He was too busy falling in and out of love with different girls. And he didn't seem too attracted to Christianity. Eventually, Albert Mackin managed to persuade him to come by asking him to drive the truck to the meeting. When they arrived, Albert's guest decided to go in and was spellbound by what he heard. He went back again and again until one night he went forward and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. That man, the driver of the truck, was Billy Graham. The year was 1934 and Billy Graham has presented the gospel to millions of people across the world. In fact, there was a girl that I baptized, a teenager who I baptized in this church. She, she came across an old Billy, Billy Graham's dead, came across a Billy Graham video and she gave her life to Christ watching YouTube. We cannot all be like Billy Graham, but we can all be like Albert McMacken. We can all bring our friends to Jesus by going out to get them. That's the challenge. Albert McMacken would never have known the potential impact of eventually persuading Billy Graham to drive that car. He could never have imagined it. We can't imagine the names on our list, the impact that these people could make simply through an invite. And so my challenge to you is this. Let me go to, the, yeah, this slide is perfect. How do I bring hope and salvation to my community? Step one, who are you connecting with intentionally? Who are you investing in? Number two. Number three, where could I, this is the question, where could I invite them that they would experience Jesus? Now, this could be in a, many different ways. For McMacken, it was an evangelistic event, right? Could be a worship event. You see an advert popping up on your Instagram, whatever, like it could be that. It could be inviting them to your life group. It could be inviting them, like getting your church friends to come to your house for, for supper and you invite your other friends to come just so that they can begin to connect. With the Hatfield students, what they do is they run simple clubs, right? Some of them are so interested in running that they, they form a group of runners. And then it's just a simple place to invite other students to come and run. And as they're connecting with each other, they realize they all go to the same church. And through that, we've had people come to church who have recommitted their lives to Christ. It's amazing. You have a passion for cycling? Some of you do. You have a passion for whatever, you, golf, whatever. Like that could be a platform for you to connect people to, with others who know Jesus and it could be the next step to coming to church. There are multiple ways, multiple places we can invite people to experience more of Jesus. And as you go through your list, I want to encourage you to pray carefully through those names. Where could you invite those people? What, what is the come and see moment? Come and see my friends. Come and see this running group. Come and see my church. Come, it's Easter. Come, there's Easter eggs, right? Whatever it is, I want to encourage you to ask the question, where could I invite? And I want to get very practical here. I'm going to be wrapping up. I'm closing. I'm closing. And no, I'm not doing what pastors do where they close. 10, 20 minutes later, they close, right? I'm, I'm here. I'm right at the end, so pay attention. Right? So Maura pointed out that Easter and Christmas are the two times in our society, like South Africans tend to think that they're Christians. <laughs> they tend to think it. When we can extend an invite and say, hey, come and experience Easter with us, they're likely to come, especially if they don't go to church, because it's kind of part of our cultural DNA. Not everyone will, 
That's why you've got to pray through it. But we, we do Easter the way that we do Easter because we know that there'll be Christians, non-Christians who come, unchurched, that will come to this event, Easter, and hear the gospel, right? And so I want to encourage you to extend an invite, to take that piece of paper. It's more, have you put it out in the WhatsApp group? Are you going to put it out of the service? So more is going to put out that image on, like out onto WhatsApp. If you're not a part of the WhatsApp group, you can be. Just go to the guest area and they'll add you, right? But we're going to send out that graphic. Take that graphic. Put it on your status. That's a simple way to invite. Low-hanging fruits. Go onto your, your community WhatsApp group and send it out and say, hey, if you guys have kids and you want a free Easter egg hunt, you've got to come to my church on Easter Sunday, right? You've got a friend who you've been praying for or a family member who you've been praying for, you say, hey, I really, this is going to be an impactful service. Why don't you come? Come taste and see. Low-hanging fruits. Something that I'm going to be doing. It's going to be something the pastors are going to be doing. Something that I believe and I hope that many of you will be doing. And so this is what I'd like us to do. I'm going to close off in prayer. Now, I mentioned that there were two, two invites that went out. The first invite was from Jesus to the individual. And that's the invite that I want to put out to, to many of you. Have you experienced the well of living water like filling you up that satisfies? Jesus is inviting each of you to experience that. And I'm not just, when we talk about salvation, it's not a once-off event. Salvation is a process. Justification is a once-off event. That's another sermon. But there's an opportunity from Jesus to say, Jesus, I need that living water that we sang about. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray that over those of you who are here saying, yes, I need that. The second thing I would like us to do is I'd like us to lift those, in our hearts, we have those who we know need the hope and salvation of Jesus. And I want us to lift up those names to the Lord together in prayer. And so I'd like to ask you to stand with me, and we're going to close off in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you know every single name, every single person that's in this hall that's online as well. We know that your word says that you know every hair on their head. You can count them. You know. Lord, you also know the depth of our hearts. You know the realities of the sin that's in our lives. And you know the realities and the condition of our soul. And for those who are standing here, we're joining us online who say, my soul is dry. I need you, Jesus. I want to pray, Holy Spirit, for a renewal work to begin in them. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. I invite you into this space, Lord, of every single person. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd fill them from their heads to their toes, that they would begin to experience and know the joy of your name the reality of your presence. And so, Lord, I pray that right now you begin to, to like bu bubble up in them like the springs of living water that you mentioned to the woman at the well. And, Lord, I think of the people that are on my list. And I pray, Lord, that you would break my heart like your heart is broken for those who do not know you. Lord, I pray that you wouldn't allow us to be satisfied with the status quo. You've called us to bring hope and salvation. And so, Lord, teach us to do that. Give us the courage to do that. Lord, we lift up every name that comes to our heart and mind, whether written down or not written down. And we pray, Lord, will you do a work in them? And will you use us? Use us, Lord. Give us the strength and the wisdom and the courage that we need to do that. And so, Lord, I think about every church that's across the city. I think of Eastside Community Churches. As people do go out and invite their friends and family members and acquaintances and colleagues to their church services, I pray that you go before them and that these, these churches in our city that know you and love you and preach your gospel, they would be filled to capacity through the simple invites of your people saying, come and see. 
Lord, I lift us up into your hands as we go out into the rest of Sunday. Will you bless us? Will you keep us? Will your face shine upon us and be gracious to us? In your mighty name, amen. Wow, can we give Jason a round of applause? Wasn't that a wonderful message? We're, we're done. You don't need to sit down. We're done. We're getting out of here. But I just wanted to say, don't rush off. We've got coffee available. So if you walk through those doors, you can go to our Connect Cafe, get a quiche, get some coffee. Uh, and just uh, hang around. I'd love to say hi. You can come up, say hi. We can just introduce ourselves and uh, have a good time. So guys, have a wonderful Sunday. Would you go with God? Grace and peace to everyone. Love you. you say, I